Tuberculous spondylitis. Tuberculous spondylitis, also known as POT disease, most frequently involves the lower thoracic and upper lumbar regions, with less frequent involvement in the cervical and upper thoracic regions. In most cases, the infection starts with inflammation of the anterior part of the intervertebral joints and extends behind the anterior ligament to include the adjacent vertebral body. When two adjacent vertebrae are infected, the infection spreads to the adjacent intervertebral disc space. Finally, the avascular disc tissue dies, causing vertebral narrowing and collapsing. Resulting in gibbous deformity, a type of structural kyphosis, disrupts spinal canal morphology, placing the spinal cord at risk of compression and resulting in paraplegia, particularly in the mid-thoracic segment where the spinal canal is relatively tight around the cord. Late-onset paraplegia may develop as a result of osteophytes and other chronic degenerative changes at a previous infection site. The most frequent symptom is local pain, with dull, boring and aching in characteristics which worsen by mechanical stress on vertebra, and relive when lying down. Pain is increasing over weeks to months and is often accompanied by muscle spasms and rigidity. Muscle spasms will spread outside the affected region. The pain was caused by the irritation of the pain-sensitive structure such as periosteum, ligament, duramater, and joint. In certain cases, the patient can exhibit a stereotypical upright stance and alderman's gait, in which the patient moves with quick, slow strides to prevent jarring of the spine. In fewer than 40% of cases, constitutional signs such as fever and weight loss are present. POT disease is often misdiagnosed due to its subacute course, especially in areas where tuberculosis is uncommon. Owing to inadequate access to medical services in endemic areas, clinical presentation is often relatively late. In these conditions, patients show symptoms and manifestations of cord compression at the point of diagnosis in 40-70% to 70 of cases. As a result, late diagnosis is a key factor in deciding the disease's outcome. The most difficult aspect of diagnosing skeletal tuberculosis is considering the diagnosis, particularly because there is no proof of active chest disease in the majority of cases. Clinical hints are normally derived from the past, and may contain concerns about the patient's country of origin as well as a history of recent confirmed or possible tuberculosis infection or interaction. Typically, radiographic anomalies are first seen in the anterior aspect of a vertebral body, with demineralization of the end plate and lack of definition of the bony rim. As a result, the opposite vertebra gets involved, and a paravertebral abscess can be seen in some cases. While involvement of contiguous vertebrae is common, non-contiguous spinal TB at multiple levels is not rare. The disc space is obliterated as the infection spreads, due to anterior wedging and angulation. Reactive sclerotic modifications remain localized, and the remaining vertebral components are frequently spared. Computerized tomography, myelography, and magnetic resonance imaging are also useful diagnostic instruments for musculoskeletal tuberculosis. MRI is particularly useful in illustrating soft tissue expansion and encroachment on adjacent essential structures like the spinal cord. The ideal duration of therapy for the treatment of musculoskeletal tuberculosis is unknown. Six to nine months of first-line treatment is appropriate for the majority of patients receiving first-line agents. For patients on regimens that do not contain rifampin and or for patients with extensive or advanced disease, a longer period of therapy, nine to 12 months, is required particularly if assessing reaction to therapy is difficult. Patients require surgical intervention if advanced developmental deficits and spinal disorders. Patients with spinal disease and deteriorating developmental deficits that are receiving adequate treatment. Patients that have spinal disorder and a kyphosis of more than 40 degrees at the time of diagnosis. Patients suffering from a cold abscess on the chest wall. Decompression, the use of hardware for spine stabilization, abscess draining, or debridement of contaminated substances are also examples of surgical intervention. If you find this video helpful, please hit the subscribe and bell buttons. And don't forget to like and share this video. Thanks!